Good morning and welcome to the Liverpool.com podcast on the Blood Red channel. I'm James Martin. I'm joined by Matt Addison, who from the piece I just edited seems like he's just enjoyed a nice little jaunt over in Hungary watching Dominic Sobers lie. How was your break, Matt? Yes, uh, as I'm sure hasn't gone unnoticed on our rotor, I do tend to take a few days off during every international break and managed to, to get across to uh, to Budapest for the last few days. So that's been been really, really nice and obviously got to, to see Dominic Sabozlai as well. Um, I was there in the mix zone afterwards, but he was only allowed to speak in Hungarian rather than English. So that didn't make it particularly easy for me to, to get any quotes off him. But yeah, it was, uh, was really interesting to see it. And as people will be able to read on our website, a piece that I've written about sort of basically how unexpected it was to me. I knew he was big. I knew he was kind of the superstar in Hungary. But yeah, the the extent to which everything in Hungary is about Dominic Sabozlai took me a little bit by surprise, I have to say. So yeah, it was was really good to get over there. Nice to have a little break and I managed to to take in a new stadium, really nice stadium as well, the, the Puskas Arena. Um, so yeah, it, it was a good few days, but obviously looking forward now to the rest of this season and getting back to seeing Sabozlai in a, a Liverpool shirt instead. Absolutely, a well-earned break for sure and a good piece as well, well worth the read. That's going up at 12 o'clock, so be sure to check that out. But yes, as you say, diving into what's left of the Liverpool season and then looking a bit further beyond today as well, actually, because we're we're going to focus on the summer, of course. Lot, but lots that is still to happen between now and then. Lots of very important things that are still to happen between now and then. But Richard Hughes is obviously appointed now. He'll be joining from Bournemouth officially come the end of his contract there, so end of the season. Obviously, Michael Edwards is in place as the CEO of football for FSG rather than specifically Liverpool. So the pieces are beginning to fall into place. And of course, the big thing is the new manager, which we might touch upon a little bit. But once that's in place, there's still all the normal stuff to sort out, isn't there? There's contracts and there's transfers. So, yeah, I mean, let's look at transfers. It's funny now, isn't it, when you look back at last season and we were talking about the scale of the rebuild and how it was such a big kind of rebuilding season. And then you fast forward a year and, and you know Klopp's on his way out, Michael Edwards is back. But this, this seems to be the real rebuild. But do you think, on a transfer front at least, it'll be a bit of a quieter one? I would suspect so. I think I've thought, I've thought that really for, for a while, that Liverpool don't really have any obvious positions that you'd look at and think that they need to strengthen. Obviously, Matip is coming to the end of his contract. I think we have to assume that he will probably leave rather than get a new one. There's obviously other players as well. I mean, Thiago is, is in a similar situation. So I think that, that there's a couple of positions that you'd think it would be nice for Liverpool to strengthen, but it's not like last season where you knew that they probably needed two or three midfielders. Then we had a couple of surprises. They end up needing four midfielders. It, it's not going to be quite like that, I don't think. And the fact that Michael Edwards, uh, Richard Hughes, a new manager, Jurgen Klopp leaving, the, the fact that there's a bit more turmoil off the pitch this time rather than on the pitch, I think it just makes a lot more sense for it to be a slightly quieter summer. Now, obviously, we wouldn't be doing this podcast if I thought that Liverpool weren't going to sign anybody and that was the best thing for them, not to sign anybody. The, the kind of purpose of the next half an hour or so is to, to have a think about what Liverpool might do and, and what positions they might need to, to look at, at strengthening and you know various other bits around the squad. But I don't think it will be quite so wholesale. I think it, it's probably more sensible to do one or two positions when a new manager comes in they're going to want to, to change things up a little bit I think it makes sense to do at least one each summer just to you know continually refresh and, and make sure that you're not leaving too much to one summer as they did last year um, I think it, it makes sense also in the sense of if you're changing a manager you don't want things to be completely different and you know completely do a u-turn in, in terms of, of what they're doing what they're doing is clearly working. So continue with that. Don't do, do too much in, in one go. I think they probably did leave themselves with too much last summer. It worked. They got away with it. Obviously, they got away with it in terms of this season, less so last season when they dropped out of the Champions League. But purely in terms of from last season onwards, it kind of worked. But that isn't always going to be the case. So I think you'd like to see as, as few changes as possible. But that's not to say that there won't be a couple of signings because I suspect that there probably will be. Yeah, I think that's an important point in terms of getting things done at the right time, not leaving things too late and sort of making sure you're refreshing rather than rebuilding, I think is probably the key. And for me, when I'm looking at the squad now, I think you have to look at the defence in terms of where do we need to buy now to make sure we're not in this situation we were in with the midfield again in another couple of years. I don't think it's imminent, but you look at Van Dijk, 
you don't want to be replacing Van Dijk because he's been the best defender in the league again this season, possibly the best in the world. He, he's certainly up in those conversations again. Those are the levels he's reached. But the way Liverpool has operated at its best is kind of getting those replacements in ahead of time to sort of learn the craft and maybe get minutes here and there and eventually take over in a more kind of gradual, studied way. So you sort of look at the squad and think, do we already have Van Dijk's successor? We might do. Obviously, there's Canate. Jarrell Kwanzaa has had an excellent season. Joe Gomez is still, what, 26, 27? He's, he's not old anyway, uh, which is remarkable considering he's the only player to have, have served through the entire Klopp era. But yeah, it's it's one of them where there are players there, but I'd want to be thinking about it, I think. And then you have the same situation at left back where you have Andy Robertson, who's you know 30. You have Costa Simakas, who's only a little bit younger, I think 27, 28. So he's not going to be the long-term heir to Robertson. You know, maybe he has another couple of years when Robertson does move on. But that's maybe the position where you think two, three seasons down the line, we don't want to be looking at it where that is still the first choice back line. And maybe that this is the summer where you start at least the recruitment process for that. Are there, are there any names that kind of jump out to you from a defensive sense? Or do you think you'd be focusing recruitment elsewhere? I think left-sided centre-back and, and left-back is probably the, the thing that I would look at similar to you, really, in terms of the obvious starting point for where Liverpool need to look at. But I wouldn't necessarily think that that was two players. I think that's probably one. I think that is what Liverpool looked at last summer. They obviously look at, uh, looked at Levi Colwell and, and weren't able to get him. I think the problem last summer and probably for me this summer is that there wasn't anybody that they thought was clearly perfect or good enough or available at the right price. I know there was links to a couple of different players. There's, you know, Gonzalo Inacio, for example, obviously, you know, somebody that is very highly rated from what I've seen of him and from what you read about him, people do seem to, to think that he has got that ceiling and he's got that next level to be able to jump to if he was to move to, you know, a bigger club, if he was to, to come across to England and, and the Premier League. But clearly Liverpool didn't think that that was the case last summer, otherwise they would have done it then. So I think that the difficulty really in terms of, of the the position is that there's not loads of outstanding players. That makes it all the more important that Liverpool, if there is one that pops up and, and becomes available on the market, it's even more important that Liverpool do it. Because as you say, if you wait a year or two, it's not necessarily going to be the case that there's somebody else obvious that jumps out on the market then. So if there is somebody that they can go and do this summer in that position, I think they will do that. The question for me really is who is, who is that person? I don't really have an outstanding name. I think there's, there's probably five or six that you could pick out across the continent that you'd think, you know, maybe they would, you know, take the majority of the boxes. I think there's there's probably, um, given that Matip is going to be leaving, I think there's there's a necessity to to pick somebody, even if it's not the perfect option. I don't think it's one where Liverpool can can lose a centre back and, and not bring somebody else in, as well as Gerald Kwanzaa has done. Um, we know that the injury record of, of Canate isn't perfect. Van Dijk is going to be 33, I think, in the summer. So th there's definitely a need to do something. You know, that's that's up to Michael Edwards and, and Richard Hughes and whoever else is involved in that process to, to find out that name. For, for me, there's there's no obvious candidate at this point unless unless somebody like, say, Colwell suddenly became available because the situation at Chelsea changed and they needed to get money in. You know, maybe there's something like that that could happen. For me, though, right now, I think it's definitely a left-sided centre-back slash left-back that Liverpool need. Who that is, I think, is is a, a much more tricky question to answer. Yeah, and as you say, that is the job of Michael Edwards and Richard Hughes. We are talking about their role in the summer today, so I'm going to take us on a on a brief detour away from the specifics of the playing squad because you, you mentioned Inacio there, and then another one of those names maybe in your five or six might be Piero Hincapié. We've seen links to him crop up. And what's interesting there is, of course, Inacio is at Sporting, in Capie is at Bayer Leverkusen. So you look at that and then you look at the managers of those respective clubs being Ruben Amarim and Xabi Alonso. But then you look at Edwards and Hughes and you look at what sort of tempted Edwards back into the fold and you're thinking, you know, Klopp's been here for nine years. His influence has naturally built up behind the scenes. With a new manager, we can safely assume they're going to have less influence on, on recruitment. But do you think that the identity of the new manager is still going to be an important factor for Hughes and Edwards in sort of determining who they want to buy. 
Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to say, isn't it? I think they will clearly be be led by the data in terms of of who it is, but it is clearly an advantage at the same time if you know, Xabi Alonso knows Piero in Capier, for example, if if that makes sense to bring in a player like that. I don't think Liverpool would do it purely on that basis, but it's probably not a bad thing that he's got somebody who can, you know, transition across and be able to to pass on to the other players exactly how it was that you know Alonso did things at Leverkusen and I think there is almost a bit of a transitional aspect in terms of of that you could potentially see as a little bit of an edge but I don't think that'll be you know something that they think about primarily it's it's got to be the right player hasn't it I mean Incapier is interesting I don't know really in the last sort of couple of months but certainly at the start of the season he wasn't in Xabi Alonso's first choice team this season he was on the bench for a lot of the first half of, of this season now clearly he's still a very young player he's still you know got a lot to, to offer um he's clearly very highly rated and, and very talented but I think that's that's an interesting element to it as well that you know just because Alonso came doesn't mean that Incapier would come as well for for both of those reasons really he wasn't Clearly, the, the first option on the left side of, of the Leverkusen defence, as I say, that may have, have changed. Now, I can't say to, I can't say honestly that I've watched every single Leverkusen game this season, so I don't know. But um, I think there's there's a lot more nuance to it in terms of, of who Liverpool would look at than just, well, they're going to get the, the sporting manager or the Leverkusen manager, whoever it might be, that they'll go for, for players in that group. I'm sure that won't stop the transfer stories of Xabi Alonso raiding his former club and, and things like that, just as you know, Jurgen Klopp was linked with so many Dortmund players when he first came over to, to Liverpool. Um, but I, I don't think that that would be a disadvantage, certainly. It would definitely be a good thing if if there was a little bit of a transition with the, the players as well as the manager. But I think if I was going to pick any Leverkusen player, it would probably not be in Capier, it would probably be Florian Burtz. Yes, who we will come to in greater detail shortly. I think you're right. It's it's that case of striking a balance. It's not going to be the new manager walks through the door and says, I want X player, Y player, and in they come. But I do wonder whether in terms of prioritising the summer, maybe Hughes and Edwards are going to want a pretty good idea, at least of who the manager is going to be before they decide who, who they're going to sign in just in terms of what style they might want to play and like you say being led by the data in that respect in terms of who would be a good fit for I don't really know what to call it anymore I was going to say Liverpool 2.0 but Klopp's kind of nicked that for this season so maybe Liverpool 2.1 but um, the next version of this team anyway uh, but yeah it's an interesting one and so the defence I think we agree is probably the main priority but as you say you, you've got your eye on Florian Verts so kind of sprinkling a style quality a bit further forward uh, just talk me through that. What's the thinking? Where do you think he, he fits in? Is he filling a gap or is he one of those that's just that good that he should be a Liverpool player? A little bit of both, really. I think he's clearly a huge talent. I, I love watching him. I loved the goal he scored after seven seconds for Germany during the international break. I just think he's an unbelievably good footballer. He reminds me a lot of Coutinho, who's one of my favourite Liverpool players purely to, to watch, obviously. Um, we all know how that ended and, and what has happened to him since. But just in terms of aesthetically, the, the way that he plays football, I just think he's an absolute joy to watch. I think he's an unbelievably good footballer, still so young. I think he's definitely the, the next one at Leverkusen who should get a move somewhere else. I know his, I can't remember whether it's his agents or his dad or, or maybe maybe both um, that have, have spoken about you know maybe not being in such a rush to leave Leverkusen. They might do another season. They're you know very carefully going to plan this out. I know he's had a big injury in the past, but he seems to have got over that. So. I think there's there's definitely an expectation in my mind that he will move somewhere in the summer and I'd very much like that to be Liverpool. So it, it's a bit of an opportunistic one in that sense. But I just think in terms of, of Liverpool's squad as well, he, he feels to me like one that would, if Liverpool are going to play with this kind of system that they've got now with you know advanced midfielders like Jones or Sabozlai, it feels like Florian Verts could play in, in one of those roles. He could also do a little bit in the forward line as well, which I know people will look at that and think that Liverpool have got you know, five senior attackers as it stands. Obviously, they've got to sort out a contract with Salah. There's been, you know, quotes from Luis Diaz's dad about him fancying a move to Spain in the last couple of days. There's there's a couple of questions in the, the forward line, but I just think you can never have too many good attackers. I think Liverpool need, considering, you know, that the Champions League next season is, is expanded, there's, there's going to be more matches. The matches that Liverpool play are going to be you know, a lot more difficult. You know, this season they've had a lot of injuries. They've had, you know, forwards. Diogo Jota is in any season really prone to, to picking up injuries. But 
I just think you can never have too many. You can never have too many options. And when Liverpool are going to have a much trickier season, I think, next season in terms of you know what happens in terms of the Champions League, the, the matches that they're going to play, that they're not going to be able to make 11 changes against Toulouse, for example, as they did this season. Or, you know, the, with, with all due respect to the opponents that they're playing in the Europa League, even from this position, you know, you know, they, they may end up playing Benfica in a semi-final, for example, but Benfica could be your easiest group match next season, quite feasibly, because of you know the, the quality of, of, of the opposition. So th- there's so many matches these days that the quality that Liverpool are going to need next season is going to be stepped up a notch. And for me, Florian Burtz is a player that could play, well, he could play quite easily at the top level for the next decade, but he could also play in a couple of different positions for Liverpool. It would just, as you said at the start, add a lot of, of star quality really to, to what Liverpool already have. And I think it's it, it feels to me if, if Leverkusen win the league, it makes sense for Xabi Alonso to make the next step. It probably makes sense in the same way for Bert and Capier, maybe one or two of the other you know star players in this Leverkusen team. It's probably not going to get any better at Leverkusen. It, it might be the, ne- the 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 right time to to make that next step. And if he does move, I think you know it's it's going to be one of the the big clubs. It'll be a Liverpool, a City, a Real Madrid. I'd very much like Liverpool to be in that conversation. Yes, and I think you make a good point about the need for quality depth sort of stepping up next season, not only are Liverpool back in the Champions League, but of course they're back in an expanded Champions League, make about what you will. Personally, can't say I'm a huge fan, but we'll we'll see how it goes. But, but, you know, the bottom line is it's more fixtures and more important than ever to have that kind of deep squad. I mean, for me, that probably puts me in the kind of place where I'm not necessarily looking at any kind of marquee sales I mean you look at a couple of players who may be mm. under different circumstances if a bid came in may, maybe Liverpool would be looking at it but do you think sort of the combination of of the depth that's going to be needed and the fact that there's already quite a lot of upheaval means that maybe Hughes and Edwards are going to be looking at it looking at players I mean you mentioned Diaz who's sort of been semi kind of eyeing up a move through his dad to, to, to one of the Spanish giants. So you, look, you look even at Gakpo, who's come in for some some flack in recent times. I mean, I wouldn't be selling them. I don't imagine you would be selling them. But, but would you sort of agree with that assessment that with all the change to those players who maybe might have been for sale at the right price are now more or less locked down? Yeah, I mean, you, you can't rule anything out in terms of, you know, potential sale but for somebody that is maybe a surprise after what happened last summer I don't think any of us expected Jordan Henderson to go to Saudi Arabia for example uh, we know how that has turned out and I don't think that the Saudi project will be quite so appealing to, to Liverpool players this summer I think there was probably a few that were looking at it to think you know maybe maybe that might be something for the future maybe they might have, have changed their minds on that or maybe delayed it a little bit further than than what they might have done originally so I think there's there's definitely factors that will come into it, but I think you're right to say that Liverpool don't want to add too many unnecessary things to an already fairly lengthy to-do list. I think if if you could get one or two players in and you could tie down Van Dijk, Trent and Mohamed Salah for at least a couple of years in terms of the older players, obviously significantly longer than that with, with Trent as he enters his peak years, I think that would be pretty much the, the perfect summer really for Liverpool in terms of, of a transition I don't think Liverpool can afford to lose Jurgen Klopp and one of the big hitters at the same time. Equally, when you're looking at the contracts in terms of Van Dijk and Salah, if you were to offer each of them, say, a two-year extension because of the age that they are and you don't want to go beyond that too much, I think it was was three years, wasn't it, for, for Salah last time? You know, Maybe you could stretch it to three years for, for each of them again. I think you don't want to be in a situation where maybe in the same way that you don't want to lose Klopp plus one this time, in two or three years' time, you don't want to lose, say, Van Dijk and Salah in the same summer. You want to, to kind of stagger that and, and make sure that those are at different times. So it's not just this summer that Liverpool have got to think about. They've got to think about the future as well. It, it just it feels like a tricky balance to get right. But I think you almost have to just do each thing step by step. The contracts, I think, have got to be the first thing. Then maybe get one or two additions in. But I think as a, as a base point, I would go into the summer not really thinking that Liverpool could afford to lose anybody big in terms of, you know, a Diaz or something like that. I, I don't think that would be something that Liverpool would look at. And I don't think that would be sensible either, because as I say, it, it would just add something else for, you know, in what is going to be a summer of change. It would just add another thing. If I know that there's been a bit of a conversation around Diaz and Gakpo in terms of their output and the numbers, but 
to get somebody in who is going to produce more numbers is going to cost you a lot of money and it's going to be very difficult. I don't think I don't think there's too many options out there that are better than those players. If there are, you know, it's it's a marginal difference. I think that the, the reality is for Liverpool this summer that the bigger picture is that there's a lot more stuff to do than than thinking about that. Maybe that's one for for next summer if if Luis Diaz is you know, edging towards a, a move to Spain in 2025, for example. I think that's maybe a little bit more palatable than trying to do that this year as well. Yeah, and you touched on the contracts there. They've sort of been lurking in the background of all of the discussion we've been having, really. I mean, even you look at someone like Verts and you think, if we're signing a star like that, does that mean Salah's on the move? And it's just everything at the club is sort of coloured by the uncertainty. I mean, even from the defensive discussion we were having at the start, Van Dijk sort of, triggered a bit of worry didn't he he's rode back on it but you know when Klopp first left he made those comments which were maybe a bit taken out of context a bit misconstrued about how you know nobody knows what the future holds with all of this uncertainty um he's made some comments since which very much sound like his head is at Liverpool for well into the future so let's hope that's the case but it is a an awkward bracket isn't it I mean you look at Trent like you say and, and it should be straightforward not in the sense that it'll be an easy deal to strike necessarily because he can rightly demand a lot of money. Liverpool won't want to shatter the wage structure. We've we've been in this situation with Salah's last extension, so I'm not necessarily saying it'll be easy. But in terms of from Liverpool's perspective, that's one you want to get done, and you can offer a long term deal. But then, as you say, the other ones, it's kind of that area where, I mean, you look at Van Dijk, who I mentioned earlier, has been the best in the league. You look at Salah; he's certainly been up there again they've still been two of Liverpool's most important players this season. So in terms of all of those factors, you look at it and you think, you know, they have to get renewals. But like you say, it if you're looking at sort of longer than, than two-year extensions, you're sort of bringing them into, you know, 35, 36 kind of territory in terms of their ages. And we know Michael Edwards has sort of in the past maybe been a little bit reluctant to hand out these these longer contracts to older players so that's another factor to to throw in the mix but I, I think you're right in an ideal world you give them two years and they're happy with that but to sort of give you a tricky scenario what if one of Van Dijk or Salah is saying you know I'm, I need three years I need four years what, what do Liverpool do then are they backed into a corner or do, do they sort of make the concession because as you say we need to limit uncertainty and these are still very important players I suppose it depends on the, the finances, doesn't it? I don't know exactly what Virgil van Dijk earns at the moment, but I think there's a scenario where he could go to them and say, well, the last time I signed this contract, I wasn't Liverpool captain. I now am. I'm still you know, proving that I am one of the best, if not the best in the world still. I think he's comfortably the best centre-back in the Premier League at the moment. There's no signs of, of that dropping off. Um, you know, There's, there's plenty of, of examples, really, of, of players who played well into their 30s at centre-back. I think... I would be more open to going longer with Van Dijk than Salah for that reason. I think you can see less of a drop off with Van Dijk, and even if even if there was a slight drop off, I think he'd still be, you know, right up there in terms of the very best. I think he he, he offers a, a significant amount to Liverpool. I think the, the bigger problem would be depending on, um, you know, Mohamed Salah's demands if he wants another pay rise and he wants another three years. I think that maybe gives you a bit of a a quandary in terms of what you do I think there's 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 also a bit of a question mark over you know how much does he fancy Saudi Arabia at some point and if Liverpool for example could give him three years but basically between them there was a bit of a handshake to say after two years there's 100 million you know release clause if you want to go to, to Saudi Arabia at that point maybe there's something like that that you could talk about and, and put into a deal it, it just depends really on on a couple of different factors if if Virgil van Dijk was prepared to say stay on the same wage that he is now, I think you'd then maybe you know more easily give him that four years. It, it just it depends on the, the variables really. I think what we saw from the Mohamed Salah negotiation last time is that that's not necessarily going to be particularly easy for Liverpool to do. I think again he can probably point to his numbers this season. He's clearly still Liverpool's most important attacking player. Okay, he's missed you know a couple of months now with. With injury, I don't think that's necessarily a sign of he's suddenly now an injury-prone player. That may well have been a one-off, but I think there's with both of them a case to be made that they are still the best in their position in the world. Certainly in the Premier League, certainly for Liverpool, I think that makes it a little bit tricky. And 
I can understand why, because Liverpool haven't had a sporting director and the structure and they don't still have a manager in place for beyond Jurgen Klopp, but they haven't left themselves loads of time to, to do this. I think, you know, if you get down to the final summer in the past, we've seen it with Wijnaldum, with Mane, with various players, that it tends to just be that, um, you know, they're, they're either sold or, or, or they wind down the contract and, and eventually go for free. I don't think Liverpool will want that to be the case with either of all three of these players, obviously Trent as well, but you know, with Van Dijk and, and with Salah, that, that won't be the case. But at the same time, it is it, it's a relatively small window, I think, to do what could be some some pretty tricky negotiations in terms of these players. Yeah, I don't envy Michael Edwards or Richard Hughes. I mean, just looking at the comments as well, as someone says if we get Alonso, it's going to be three centre backs. I mean, that's that's not a given, but it's it's certainly a possibility given that we've seen him play three at the back with Leverkusen. If that's the case, that kind of changes transfer priorities, but it also changes the picture with Van Dijk because, as he points out, you know the workload in a three is very different to the workload in a two. You referenced defenders who've gone on a long time. We can look at Thiago Silva, who you know up until quite recently was was you know still going very strong, but again in a system which sort of highlighted his strengths and sort of hid away the the, the growing weaknesses. So that there's so many uncertainties and so many variables that all of these decisions we've talked about kind of feed into one another and it's just a case of where do you start really once one thing happens you get the sense that it's all going to fall into place but as i said at the top there's still 10 very important games to happen before we can really start focusing on it too much i mean even with the new manager as well i mean alonso has some very important games to come so we can't really be making any progress with him in this time either or the same applies for Amarim you know he's in a title race in Portugal so you you have to think it's just a case of patience really there, there's so much stuff to happen but that kind of first domino isn't going to fall just yet but we're getting closer with Richard Hughes in with, with Michael Edwards in and hopefully we'll know some more very very soon but thanks Matt it's been a good discussion enjoyed it it's certainly going to be an interesting summer and we'll keep you posted with all of the developments as and when we know them for now thanks everyone for listening be sure to check out liverpool.com for our content for the rest of the day including Matt's Sobers live piece in about half an hour uh, plenty more on top of that as well there's some more content on the Blood Red channel as well so do have a watch of that and we'll see you all very soon thanks a lot